Hello and welcome to Socialism, the Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. How did Trotsky help organize international socialist struggle? Capitalism is a worldwide problem. Since the days of Karl Marx, socialists have worked towards a worldwide solution. And there have been multiple attempts to organize international associations of revolutionaries. Each rose and then fell for different reasons. How can we learn from their successes and failures? What was Trotsky's part in building internationals? And what are the prospects for building a mass revolutionary working class international going forward? This episode of Socialism looks at the struggle for a world party of revolution. Trotsky and the Fourth International. So this latest episode in our series on Trotsky and Trotskyism looks at Trotsky and the Fourth International. And we're here today with Robert Beckett from the Committee for a Workers' International. Hello, Robert. Hi. Now, one of the things that Leon Trotsky is known for is the idea of world revolution. And this is as opposed to Joseph Stalin's idea of socialism in one country. What's the basis of this? It really is that... Trotsky, through his life, defended the basic ideas of the socialist movement, the workers' movement, and indeed of Marxism. And that is really rooted in the fact that capitalism created a world market and in that sense integrated the world. And in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels in 1848 outlined that. And obviously, in the nearly two centuries since then, we've seen a tremendous development of this integration of the world economy, of how all parts of the world are interlinked together. And from that point of view, the question of changing society, the question of changing the world, while the struggles begin in the different national states, they very rapidly raise the question of what is happening in the world. How can the world be changed? And it's not simply a question about economics. We also particularly see it now in regard to climate change, the environment. Many of these issues can only be resolved on an international basis and also on the basis of breaking capitalism's grip over the world and its economy and its resources. So that was the basis. That was the basic idea that Trotsky and many others fought for and defended in the workers' movement and was the basis of their internationalism. So when we use the word international as a noun, we talk about an international, we're talking about a world association of revolutionary organisations. But of course, this is about the fourth international. That suggests that there were at least three internationals beforehand. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, the Communist Manifesto was actually produced by the Communist League, which was an international organisation of revolutionaries mainly based in Europe at that particular time, who saw their task, even then, in the 1840s, as trying to transform, at least at that stage, Europe, with obviously a wider view for what that would mean for the entire world. And that has meant that since then, in the workers' movement, there have been repeated efforts to build international organisations which could link together the workers' organisations in different countries, help those organisations to develop, but also be an instrument for changing the world. And the numbers really refer to the idea of building an international. The first international, which was formed in 1864, was a broad organisation which brought together different types of workers' organisations, both political organisations and trade union organisations at that time. But the idea was of trying to link the organisations together. That organisation existed for a number of years, then after defeats in the 1870s, it dissolved itself. But still there was the idea of forming an international. And once again an attempt was made in 1889 to reform an international. And that international played a crucial role in building the different socialist organisations in uh, Europe. So that was then the second international? The second international. That played a crucial role in building the workers' organisations in different countries, especially in Europe, but also beyond Europe as well for the first time. And that really played a role in building these large organisations 
in popularizing the idea of socialism, as well as struggling on immediate issues, and that is a big task for us still today, because if you look at many left leaders in the world today, or so-called left leaders in the world today, they sometimes they say that they're against capitalism and things like this, but they don't actually argue for a socialist alternative. They downplay it. You know, like for Jeremy Corbyn, the former leader of the Labour Party in Britain. If you asked him when he was a socialist, he would say that he's a socialist, but he didn't, when he was leader of the Labour Party, campaign for socialism, for the idea of socialism. And the Second International did do that. But at the same time as it became a mass force, it also within it developed a conservative layer, a layer, especially in the leadership, which was prepared to, if you like, work with capitalism, increasingly drew away from the revolutionary foundations on which the international was originally built. And this really was symbolized in some of the political clashes which developed in that international in the early part of the 20th century. But then, when the First World War broke out in 1914, the majority of the leaders of the socialist parties in the different belligerent countries, the countries which were participating in the war, the majority of these leaders supported their own national capitalist classes in that war. And that really symbolised a breakdown of that international, because just two years before the outbreak of the First World War, the Second International could see that a war was coming, it said that the workers' organisations must do what they could to try and prevent a war taking place. But if a war broke out, then those socialist organisations must prepare, if you like, for a campaign, prepare for struggling to remove capitalism, to remove the sources of the war. And all of these ideas, which had been agreed almost unanimously two years before, were dropped in 1914, and that led Trotsky and other leaders of the left in the workers' movement, like Benin, like Rosa Luxemburg, and many others, to see that what was needed was to build a new international, an international which would be more clearly politically based, and would reject this idea of collaboration with the different capitalist classes. And that gave rise to this idea of building a new international, was linked together with the success of the Russian Revolution in 1917 and resulted in 1919 in the formation of the Communist International or the Third International. So the First International then, this was officially called the International Working Men's Association. That was the language of the time, although it should be noted that women were permitted to join and in fact Karl Marx fought for the right of women to participate and be elected onto its leading bodies. But the International Working Men's Association involved Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, and it's important as well to point that out, I think, because some capitalist commentators and even some on the left tend to give this impression that Marx and Engels were these mere philosophers commenting from the sidelines on world events, simply analysing things, and they did analyse things brilliantly. But in fact, much more than that, they were intimately involved in the first attempts to construct revolutionary parties, in fact, not just on a national but on a world scale, in what became known afterwards as the First International. This collapsed because of the defeat of revolutionary movements later in the 19th century, then an attempt to re-establish that was the Second International. This collapsed because of the various different leaders of the main parties of the Second International backing the capitalist classes rather than going for an attempt to overthrow capitalism at the beginning of the war. That's the history up until the First World War. So why was it, after the collapse of the Second International, from 1914 onwards, that Trotsky devoted so much of his time to these international questions? I think there are two fundamental reasons for that. First of all, as I outlined a bit earlier, internationalism in the sense of a real international perspective, the idea that the world has got to be changed, has been an important basis of the workers' movement. And the effect of the collapse, political collapse of the Second International, I mean, as an organisation, it staggers on. I mean, most of its main parties have left it still staggers on with an office in South London, but doesn't do much to this day. But this political collapse of the Second International posed very sharply, as I said before, the rebuilding of the International. And for activists like Trotsky, as well as the struggle in our own countries, the question of struggling to rebuild an International, to rebuild a force which can change the world, became a decisive importance. And they realised their own responsibility in that task. And that is why, in the First World War, Trotsky, Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg and others 
devoted much of their time, not just to the issues in their own countries, but the question of rebuilding the international. And especially after the success of the Russian Revolution in 1917, the question of the spread of the overthrow of capitalism, the question of the victory of the revolutions, which were then taking place in different countries in Europe, was absolutely crucial for the survival of the Russian Revolution. And therefore, the tasks, if you like, of strengthening the revolution in Russia, but also of supporting revolutions developing in other countries was absolutely crucial for the question of what would be the fate of the Russian Revolution. So you'd gone through the first international, the International Working Men's Association, which included, as you said, trade unionists, different trade union organisations, but also a combination of different socialist trends and also anarchist trends. With the departure of the anarchists, the next international was based largely on mass socialist parties, particularly in Europe. That collapsed with the First World War. The third international was then founded, and its name was the Communist International, or Comintern. Why did Trotsky, after 1933, having helped establish the Comintern, then set the goal of building a new international movement, something that he, along with Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg and others, had done less than 20 years previously? That's a very good question, and it really links in to the question of what was the fate of the Russian Revolution and also the revolutions which took place in different countries around the end of the First World War. I mean, the Communist International was the biggest revolutionary international movement that we've ever seen. Now, I don't mean by that that it had the same numbers participating in it, say, as we saw nine years ago, or nearly ten years ago now, in the first Arab Spring, or in some of the big, really massive international movements we've seen, whether it be against the Iraq War or on the climate in the recent period. But what the movement which built the Communist International was, was a large-scale international movement of men and women coming together from the point of view of building revolutionary organisations which could change the world, not simply protesting, not simply building an organisation which could link together struggles in different countries, which could organise solidarity, all of which is very important. But the idea of building a political organisation which could, if you like, lead to victories in the different revolutions which were taking place at the time it was launched, but also which would develop in the future. And so it was a very, very significant force. And it's the reason why, for instance, in many capitalist countries, there were attempts to suppress the growth of the communist international and the growth then of the local communist parties. All sorts of repressive measures were taken in different countries, including in so-called democracies taking place at that time. And it was an extremely significant movement. Some of the parties which grew out of the communist international very quickly became large parties with large memberships of tens of hundreds of thousands of members, parties which were involved in different struggles. But tragically, despite that, the Russian Revolution remained isolated and the revolutions in different countries which were taking place in the 1920s, they remained isolated. And as we try and explain in the CWI and in the material we produce, including the book we're producing now, to mark the 80th anniversary of Trotsky's assassination. Because of the isolation of the Russian Revolution, we saw that revolution begin to wither. We saw the workers' democracy, which had begun to be established in the Soviet Union, be swept away, and the growth of a bureaucratic elite, which gradually accumulated privileges and then sought to defend those privileges by, if you like, entrenching their rule, and by suppressing the elements of workers' democracy and increasingly becoming dictatorial. And this was the process which took place, especially from the mid-1920s onwards. And had also repercussions in the international movement, in the communist international itself. That increasingly, the democracy inside the communist international was reduced, was shrunken. The leadership which were based in Moscow, then the capital of the Soviet Union, a leadership which was subservient to the ruling group around Stalin in the Soviet Union, they increasingly established a bureaucratic rule inside both the international and inside the parties. Even the formal democracy was swept away. During the period when Lenin and Trotsky were alive, every year there was a Congress of the Communist International. After Lenin's death, the Congresses became more infrequent. 
Towards the end of the Communist International, they had one Congress, the 6th Congress in 1928, then they had a Congress in 1935, and then they were dissolved in 1943. Even formally, it wasn't a democratic organisation. But alongside that, and it wasn't simply a question of democracy, politically, politically, the Communist International began, on the one hand, initially to zigzag between different policies, but increasingly, what it was doing was being determined by what was in the interest of the ruling group in the Soviet Union. And with the development of the Great Depression of the 1930s, in that situation, Germany became a key point of struggle. On the one hand in Germany, it was the strongest country and largest country in Europe. It had the largest communist party in the world outside of the Soviet Union. It was suffered enormously through the Great Depression. And also, in 1930, we saw a tremendous leap forward of the forces of fascism of Hitler's Nazi party, which enormously expanded between 1929 and 1930 as the crisis hit. And this meant that the struggle which would take place in Germany was going to be absolutely decisive. Absolutely decisive. But the struggle of who would win... Would it be the forces of revolution or would it be the forces of counter-revolution? And this was a struggle which played out in Germany in the early 1930s. And Trotsky, from the beginning of the crisis developing in Germany, advocated on the one hand that the Communist Party needed to argue for a united front of the workers' organisations to fight against Hitler and the Nazi party. Yes, and listeners can hear a bit more about that, by the way, in the previous episode on Trotsky fascism and the united front. And at the same time, arguing for a clear programme towards socialist revolution. This did not happen, as I'm sure we discussed in the previous podcast. And the result was an absolutely tremendous defeat for the workers' movement in 1933 with the victory of Hitler and the Nazi party. A victory which really changed the whole course of their history. The whole course of history up to this day has partly been determined by what happened in Germany in the early 1930s. And it was an absolutely tremendous defeat for what had been a mass Communist Party. The Communist Party in Germany at that time, just before Hitler came to power, was the third biggest party in the country in terms of votes. It had a huge mass membership. But it was incapable of having a correct policy which could actually defeat the fascists. And after Hitler's victory, initially the Communist International just said that everything was fine. Within a matter of a couple of months of Hitler coming to power, the Communist International was saying officially, first of all, that the tactics which they had adopted in Germany had been absolutely right. But all the way through 1933 to the end of 1933, the beginning of 1934, they had the argument that the Communist Party was getting stronger and stronger, that the proletarian revolution was getting closer and closer in Germany, and that a victory would come fairly soon. If you read their official documents, which they published from April 1933 onwards until the beginning of 1934, is filled with all these sort of statements, which are absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. It was one of the biggest defeats that the workers' movement has had. But such was the bureaucratic grip inside the Communist International that while many people had privately, many activists in the Communist International privately, had their own doubts about what had happened, Publicly, hardly anything was said. Publicly, there was agreement with this policy that everything was fine and it was heading towards a new revolution in Germany, which was absolute nonsense. And Trotsky then, looking at the situation, said not only has this been a defeat, but if a political organisation goes through such a massive defeat and then there is no debate, there is no questioning about it, that means that those organisations are politically dead that they can't be living organisations if there's no debate, if there's no criticism, if there's no challenging, when you've had not a small mistake being made, but a massive international defeat which really changed the world situation, where there was having no discussion about that. And against that background in 1933, after Hitler came to power, the Trotsky was forced, like him and others did 19 years earlier, to raise the question of building a new international. 
And that was in a very difficult situation, because obviously, with the victory of fascism, there was then a growing mood, eventually in the mid-1930s, the need to come together, to come together to fight against a fascism, which is obviously an understandable mood. But the Communist International made a complete about turn and suddenly started talking not about a united front against fascism, but a popular front by which they meant involving other political forces, not just organisations in the workers' movement, but different liberal capitalist forces and other forces in fighting against fascism, which obviously one can do in individual isolated instances that you could fight even with workers or others who supported liberal parties, for instance, they would be prepared to make a stand on a particular issue against fascism. But they extended that from the question of just fighting against fascist provocations or activities in individual circumstances. They extended their idea of unity to a political unity, which meant that the communist parties then watered down their program backed away from, if you like, arguing for the need for socialism, and instead, in order to keep these alliances alive, really trimmed their demands to demands which were acceptable within capitalism. So we saw... So they were no longer revolutionary forces at that point. Well, they were heading in that way. Now, many of the activists in the Communist Party at that stage... They felt that this was a necessary tactic. Some of them even thought, well, we've learnt the lesson of 1933. We're still revolutionaries. This is just a tactic. That's how it was sold. There was also the justifiable fear of fascism. There was fear of war. There was fear of would the Soviet Union come under attack. And at that stage, there was a very powerful mood of still defending the Soviet Union, seeing it as, if you like, the legacy of the 1917 revolution. And all of these emotional feelings, these understandable feelings, were played upon by the Communist Party leaders in order to win support for their policy. And Trotsky in 1933 said that the result of this policy will first of all put in question what happens to the Soviet Union, And secondly, will mean eventually the collapse of the existing workers' organisations, of the communist parties, and also, because they were also led by pro-capitalist leaders, of the old socialist and social democratic organisations as well. And this is something which in the recent, relatively recent period, in the last 25, 30 years, we have seen, in Europe, there's not really any truly mass communist parties at the present time. In some countries, like in Italy, they have utterly, totally disappeared, where once they were the largest membership party, a truly mass force. No, it's no real communist party today in Italy. In other countries, like in France, Spain to a certain extent, Portugal, they still exist, but they're shadows. They're pale shadows of the forces they once were. In other countries, they simply no longer exist as forces. And the same is true in some countries now for the old socialist or social democratic parties. In Italy, the old socialist party doesn't exist at all. I mean, it's just a small, tiny groups of it, but not as a mass force. The same is true of PASOK in Greece. In France, the socialist party hardly exists. In other countries, we see them much shrunken. And we can also see that these old parties don't have a future. So in that sense, Trotsky's warning and perspective of what would happen as a result of the events of the 1920s and 1930s have actually been borne out. So up until this point, Trotsky and his many tens of thousands of supporters, including in the Soviet Union, had fought within the Communist International as the left opposition, or on a global scale, the international left opposition, as a faction which supported or fought for a return to the original Bolshevik principles of workers' democracy and international revolution. When they were expelled, they considered themselves for a period even an external faction of the Communist International. But it was this thunderclap, as Trotsky put it, of the victory of fascism, the fact that this thunderclap had failed to arouse the communist international out of its political stupor. This meant, in his view, that it was unreformable and the goal was therefore to establish a new international, a fourth international, which could defend the genuine revolutionary principles of the October Revolution, could appeal to those workers who were still lost in the second and third internationals, could chart a way forward 
for a global socialist revolution. But while the other internationals that were strong in the 1930s, internationals so-called, as you've explained, they didn't really operate as we would understand an international should operate increasingly. But while these other internationals, the second and third internationals, remained strong in the 30s, and they've disappeared now, why did Trotsky's fourth international not, as he expected in 1938, become a mass force by the end of the 1940s? Well, that's a very important question because Trotsky himself was an optimist. He looked optimistically towards the future. He could see the difficulties, could understand the problems, if you like, he was faced with immediately, but also looked optimistically because he had a confidence, on the one hand, in the working class and its ability to struggle, but also to draw conclusions from its experiences and the struggles. And Trotsky expected, first of all, that there would be a world war, and he was right in that, but the outcome of the Second World War was not what Trotsky expected. On the one hand, Trotsky expected that there would be a revolutionary wave coming out of the Second World War, and that was certainly the case. If we look at different countries, in some countries it was actually really a revolutionary movement. There was a tremendous desire to change society because the war itself had come after the decade of the Great Depression. And many workers in the different countries, it was a question not just of ending the war, but also of not going back to the situation of the 1930s, wanting a better life. There was a tremendous desire for change. And there was also, although it was in a vague way, nevertheless, an idea for socialist change. And thus we saw, in different ways, in different countries, this being expressed. Would it be in terms of the popular mood, sometimes in elections, would it be you know, in different elections, in different countries, of victories for left forces, the demand for action to be taken against capitalism, attempts, especially in countries which had been occupied during the war, attempts to really change societies, which often led to either civil war or near civil war situations in different countries. In the US, we saw at the end of the Second World War, one of the biggest strike waves that it's ever seen as workers in the US demanded improvements in their living standards. And so in that sense, Trotsky was right that the end of the war produced a radicalization and in a number of countries, actually revolutionary situations. But also something else happened in the Second World War, which Trotsky did not expect in the late 1930s. Because he thought that as a result of the war, the change would take place in the Soviet Union. That either there would be a revolution against the Stalin bureaucratic elite in the Soviet Union, there would be a revolution which would go back to the ideals of the Russian Revolution of 1917, or else the Soviet Union would actually collapse as a result of the Second World War. Those were the two broad outlines of what he expected to come out of the Second World War. But neither of them came out. The Soviet Union came out enormously strengthened out of the Second World War. This is despite the tens of millions who died in the Soviet Union during the Second World War. The immense destruction which the Soviet Union suffered during the Nazi invasion. But because of the at that time, the underlying strength of the planned economy, and also because of the morale of the Soviet population and the idea of defending the Soviet Union against the invaders. We had a situation where, for a time, Stalinism emerged strengthened from the Second World War, strengthened in terms of playing the key role in defeating the Nazi army, strengthened in terms of having the largest land army in the world, a huge military machine, Strengthened in terms of prestige, because in prestige terms, it was widely understood that certainly in Europe, that the Soviet Union had played the main role in the military fight against Nazism, had an enormous prestige. And for all these reasons, Stalinism emerged strengthened from the Second World War. And the communist parties were able to play a key role in holding back the revolutionary move, because they'd as a result of the Stalinist decay of the Communist International, they had become eventually integrated into the capitalist system in the sense of being prepared to work within the capitalist system, arguing sometimes that they would have a stages theory that you take progressive steps and then at some day in the future it would come towards socialism. But in the short term it meant that in many European countries the Communist Party leaders were participants 
in governments which were formed after the Second World War, basically capitalist governments, and they went along with what these capitalist governments did. A striking example is what happened in France, where the Communist Party joined the government in France, was part of the government, and it supported the attempt of French imperialism to re-establish its colonial rule in Madagascar and what was then called Indochina, which was what is today Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. They supported the military action, the French imperialism, to try and re-establish its control in those former French colonies. Now, this is not the position of any even so-called progressive. It was just a capitulation to the interests of, in this case, the French ruling class. And the reason they did it was because they were trying to maintain their positions in the government. Because at that stage, at that stage, Stalin wanted the Communist Party leaders to be in these governments to ensure that there was no attempt by the Western capitalist powers to attack the Soviet Union. And so we had, in this situation, the communist parties in different countries, and Stalinism internationally, using its tremendous prestige to hold back the movement. And this allowed capitalism to restabilize itself in the mid-1940s, certainly in Western Europe. It was different what happened in those countries where the Soviet army was dominant. That was different because the state power in that sense was in the hands of the Soviet armies. It was different in countries like France and Italy, for example. In this way, capitalism was able to stabilize itself. And this stabilization of capitalism and the strengthening of Stalinism meant that perspectives developed differently. That while there was a revolutionary wave, capitalism was able to overcome it. And on the basis of that, and on the basis of other economic developments, the enormous destruction which had taken place in the Second World War it was estimated. It was only at the end of the 1950s. The post-war reconstruction really ended in much of Europe. So you had, if you like, a political stabilization of capitalism and the foundations laid for what became a period of long economic growth for capitalism, which meant that in that situation... While the class struggles did take place, there wasn't a sort of revolutionary crisis which would enable the forces of the Fourth International, the forces which supported the ideas of Trotsky, to become mass movements, certainly in the advanced capitalist countries. Because the bosses' profits were increasing, so it was possible for the workers to gain a little bit more out of the system without directly threatening the existence of the system. Is that right? That's what happened eventually. Initially, after the Second World War, you know, in many countries, the capitalists had to make big immediate concessions in order to try and stabilise the situation. But as you said, as the world economy entered into a period of really sustained growth in the 1950s and the 1960s, in a number of countries, significant concessions were able to be made to the working class, which, at least for a time, increased the living standards. So this explains why the Fourth International then didn't grow into a mass force. But what became of the Fourth International? Because as you pointed out, the Second International is spent. The Third International is certainly spent these days as well. Later in the 20th century, the Fourth International did continue. But the Committee for a Workers' International, which stands in the traditions of, well, in fact, the early days of the Third International, but also the early days of the Fourth International, because those are the same tradition, the Committee for a Workers' International is no longer part of the Fourth International. What became of the Fourth International? Well, the Fourth International itself suffered repression from the very beginning. You mentioned earlier about the strength of the Fourth International, the movement uh, around Trotsky in the former Soviet Union. There, many of them, the vast majority of them, actually died, were liquidated by the Stalinist leadership, not simply in the purge trial, but simply in camps taken out sometimes and shot. During the Second World War, Trotskyists faced persecution in different countries, whether it be from the fascists in different countries, or also sometimes from the Stalinists themselves, who also acted against Trotskyism. We saw that, for instance, very clearly in Vietnam, what was then in Indochina, what is today in Vietnam. In today's southern part of Vietnam, the Trotskyists from the 1930s became a sizable force. They, in fact, in some senses were bigger than the official communist parties. And the result of this, there was a bitter, if you like, competition between the two. In the end, the Stalinists under Ho Chi Minh 
who then became famous because of his role in the Vietnam War against the French and then against the US, he used military means to try and liquidate the Trotskyists in South Vietnam. There were similar clashes in different countries as well. But generally speaking, the Trotskyists, unlike what is today's southern Vietnam or what is today's Sri Lanka or a bit later in Bolivia, generally the Trotskyists were not mass forces and they were faced with a difficult situation. And when the objective situation changes, one has got to be able to adjust to the changes, not simply adjust, if you like, superficially, but to understand, to see what is changing, understand why it is changing, analyze that, and then from that, work out what are the new perspectives. We've got to, on one hand, take account of what is going on, the day-to-day developments, at the same time, not simply take today's developments on the surface as being something which will last forever or changes the whole situation. There's an interaction between, if you like, the fundamental processes which take place and what can be seen as taking place on a day-to-day basis. And unfortunately, we had a situation in the Second World War where a number of the leaders of the Fourth International were died in the Second World War, were liquidated mainly by the fascists, but also we had a situation of when it started to become clear after the Second World War that the situation wasn't exactly the situation which Trotsky had thought it would be, that some of the leaders couldn't adjust to that. And for a time, they just kept repeating, if you like, Trotsky's pre-war analysis and saying that this is what was going to come. And they were able to do that for a period of time, but then it became absolutely apparent that this wasn't taking place, that things were developing differently from how Trotsky had foreseen the actual development. And this then provoked different reactions among the so-called leaders. Some of them began, if you like, in a way, to have some elements of illusions in different strands of Stalinism. Because, as I said, Stalinism emerged strengthened out of the Second World War, but also you began to see different varieties of Stalinism. You first of all saw it in the late 1940s with the break between the, if you like, to use just the names of the leaders, the break between Tito, the then leader of Yugoslavia, as it then was, with Stalin and the Russian leadership. There was a clash of interests between these leaders. And Tito himself was a popular leader in Yugoslavia. He rested to a certain extent of popular support against the attacks of leaders of other Stalinist countries. And because of that, some of the leaders of the movement Trotsky had founded actually had illusions to a certain extent in Yugoslavia of was it developing on a different course. Similarly, a bit later, we had the clashes between the Moscow leadership and the Chinese leadership after the victory of the Chinese Revolution in 1949. And that again led to clashes between the different forces. And we had a situation in the 1960s where elements of the leaders of the organization Trotsky founded began to have, if you like, illusions and hopes in Mao Zedong on the basis that they were moving to the left, they were more radical than the Moscow leaders, etc. And they began to have some illusions in them because it was an attempt, if you like, in a way, to find a shortcut. Also, inside, say, Western European countries, we had a situation where, because it was difficult politically, because of this capitalist stabilization, what these comrades did was they began, if you like, to adapt to that. On the one hand, there was some discussion about whether capitalism had been able to overcome its crises, whether capitalism had found a way of stabilizing itself. Some people felt that, for instance, through arms expenditure, capitalism was able to stabilize itself, that when there was a threat of a recession, all the capitalists would do would be to increase arms expenditure. That would stabilize the economic situation, and hence they could go on for an indefinite period. That was what some people argued. At the same time, because of the pressures in the movement, there was also a de facto dropping of the transitional method which Trotsky had argued for. The idea of when you're fighting on immediate issues, on the day-to-day issues, at the same time, in the course of those struggles, you raise the general question of the need to change society, the need to build a movement to change society. And those sort of things were being dropped. And so over the years, in what was a difficult political situation, you had a political weakening of the organization Trotsky founded, a weakening which was going in different directions. And during that process, from the mid-1940s onwards, 
the political forces which today are in the Committee for a Workers International argued against these trends. First of all, in the mid-1940s and late 1940s, analysing what was happening, analysing the change in the world situation, trying to use the methods of Marxism to see how the situation has changed, what it meant for future developments and how the revolutionary movement should work in this new situation. It was a question of reassessing the basic ideas and not throwing away the tools, but using the tools to analyse the new situation. And that is something that happens in every turning point in history. It's something which we also faced nearly 30 years ago with the collapse of the Soviet Union and with the restoration of capitalism in the former Soviet Union in Eastern Europe as well. That was also a turning point in the world, which required the revolutionary movement to analyse that to draw lessons from that, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but to use the tools of Marxism to analyse what is happening and draw conclusions for today and for tomorrow. And it was the trend which is today, the Committee for a Workers International, which over the decades, from the mid-1940s onwards, analysed what was happening, tried to analyse the different events, using the tools of Marxism to analyse them, at the same time to keep, if you like, the essence of the revolutionary approach to these events. And that was really the process which developed, which is really the reason why the Committee for Workers International, which was at one stage whose members were part of the Fourth International, eventually emerged as a different political current, as a different political tendency and then organisation internationally. But an organisation which, as you said before, is still rooted in the basic ideas on which the Fourth International and the previous internationals were founded. So there were many different pulls in different directions on the Fourth International as it unfortunately disintegrated. But perhaps the essential thing that the forces which are now the Committee for Workers International adhered to was the centrality of the working class as the agent of socialist change, as opposed to, as you delineated there, looking to some of the different variants of Stalinism or alternatively looking to peasant guerrilla forces, which can play an important role in a revolution. But Marxists, genuine Marxists would argue, are not capable of leading a successful revolution for genuine socialism and workers' democracy on their own. That have to be the working class which does that or even in parts of Europe saying because of the upswing of capitalism the working class in the advanced capitalist countries has been bought off with higher wages and white goods it's not going to struggle and looking for example to the students instead to struggle notably in France in the late 60s when the Trotskyists, the, the, well, the so-called Trotskyists there, had a base mainly among the students and not among the industrial workers just before history's greatest revolutionary general strike broke out and therefore were not able to counter the counter-revolutionary role played by the French Communist Party, <laughs> the representative of the Third International at that point. Through all of these debates, the forces which cohered into the Committee for a Workers International in 1974 maintained the centrality of the working class. Is that right? Absolutely. And it's not a question of ignoring the different movements which took place. The struggle against the old colonial empires, because we saw in the 1950s and the 1960s the collapse of the big colonial empires, the British Empire, the French Empire, they both collapsed. If you look at the old world map, you know, after the Second World War, with whole parts of the world were painted red or green, reflecting the different colonial powers. All those empires and the Dutch Empire, they all collapsed in the 1940s and 1950s. In the 1960s, we saw also the undermining of the Portuguese Empire as well. And there was a tremendous change, these revolutionary movements, not just against empires, but like the war in Vietnam to change society. We also had the movement of different layers of the oppressed. Most recently today, we've seen the Black Lives Matter campaign. But in the 1960s, we saw the tremendous development of the fight against racism and also eventually against capitalism as well inside the United States. We saw the development of the movement among women again in the 1960s, first of all, but then in all the movements subsequent. And the question is, how do you intervene in those movements? We never rejected them. But some of these forces, they actually turned away from the working class. And give a, a concrete example. In 1968 in London, we had the demonstration of 100,000 people against the Vietnam War in October 1968. And I personally was on the organising committee the mobilising committee for that demonstration. And in discussing what demands that demonstration should have, I raised the question that we should include in the demand, a demand of the trade unions, 
to put forward a boycott of any goods going to South Vietnam which could be used to support the American war effort. You know, raise it in that way. Because what I was trying to do was to link the demonstration, make an orientation towards the working class, towards raising the question of what workers should do, not simply just keeping it as a solidarity organisation. And the supporters of the Fourth International, who were in the leading positions for that demonstration, they argued against it. They argued against it in a bit of a dishonest way, because they said, well, that's a good demand, but we have three demands and we can't have four demands. That's impossible. So they voted that they should just have three demands. In other words, not have the fourth demand, which was the question of an orientation, really, towards the working class. It's a very small example, but it symbolised how these forces, as you said, did more than just support the movements which were taking place in different countries around the world. But it wasn't simply that they did that. They turned away from really the working class. And that meant, as you said, that when the French general strike and revolution really broke out in May 1968... Yes, of course, they turned towards the movement, but because of their previous history politically, they were not prepared to intervene in that movement and weren't able to really put forward a clear line, a clear position on what should be done to take that particular movement to victory. Now, the First International, the Second International, the Third International, the Fourth International, these were all either mass world organisations or had a reasonable expectation of becoming mass organisations in short order. What are the prospects of building an international, a mass revolutionary workers international today and tomorrow? Because the CWI, that stands for the Committee for a Workers International. So why are we called that and what does that mean about the prospects for building one? Well, the name itself came out of, if you like, symbolising what we were when we launched ourselves. That we were, on the one hand, an organisation with a clear political programme. At the same time, our aim was to build a working class international. At the same time, we realised at that stage, we were very small. And if you like, we didn't want to just give ourselves a big name and, you know, try to pretend to be something that we're not. And if you look today at the prospects, on the one hand, the question, as I said earlier on, of internationalism has become absolutely key. People know from their own experience of life, from the experience of of struggle as well, of how things are interconnected. We've seen many, many examples of how a movement, a struggle or revolution in one particular country can these days have a very rapid development internationally. We saw that most recently in the last few months with Black Lives Matter. We saw it a bit earlier on with the movement on climate change. We've seen it with other movements as well. There's an understanding of how the world is linked together and the question of the need for international solutions to some of the key issues is understood by this layer. There also is, because in some countries the development of, if you like, right-wing populism And reactionary nationalism, there also is a reaction against that and understanding of the idea, the need to build an international movement. So in that sense, both the experience of life, the experience of events, and also the struggles which have taken place in the recent period really are a foundation for internationalism. And the future of building an international really depends on how the workers' movement is, in a way, in many countries, is rebuilt, is either built or rebuilt. That is the key question. Because one of the characteristics of today's situation is you've got this immense crisis at the same time as, in many countries, the workers' organisations are paralysed or really semi-paralysed. Sometimes they're relatively weak at the present time. And the question of rebuilding the workers' organisations, whether they be trade union organisations and also political organisations, is one which is absolutely key. And we are confident that on the basis of events, on the basis of struggles, that that will take place. But also, we've got to as well draw the lessons of some of the recent experiences. Because in the last 10 or so years, we've seen in a number of countries, new movements, new parties even, developing. Parties and movements of the left. We saw it with the tremendous growth for a time of Syriza in Greece. We saw it with Podemos in Spain. We've seen it in the movement which was around Corbyn when he was leader of the Labour Party in Britain. 
We've seen it in the sense of the movement, the crowds which Bernie Saunders got in his two campaigns to win the presidential nomination in the US. But out of all of these movements, for different reasons, they have come to an end. In Greece, of course, with Syriza, it was because the Syriza leadership capitulated towards the demands of capitalism. They weren't prepared to fight capitalism and to fight austerity. In Spain, we see the Podemos is in crisis because of its role in the coalition government with PSOE in Spain, which is carrying out a fundamentally pro-capitalist policy. In Britain, Corbyn refused, and we discussed with him, refused to take our advice of launching an offensive against the right wing inside the Labour Party, which from day one began to sabotage his campaign, and they ultimately succeeded. And Saunders in the US, unfortunately, he has politically retreated from his position of a few decades ago when he once was arguing for the need for a new party in the US, for building, as they called it, a Labour Party in the US. And today, while he's not formally a member of the Democrats, just works inside the Democratic Party and tries to bring his supporters into the Democratic Party, which means, in this case, supporting Biden in the election. So in all those four examples, we see ways in which movements or parties have suddenly developed, but at the same time, how political weaknesses have led those movements into dead ends, or in the case of Greece, into to betrayal. And therefore, we are confident that similar movements will develop. And what we see as our role is participating in these movements, participating in building with them, but also participating in arguing for a program and a strategy to actually achieve the aims. And that means making these movements not just ones of protest and ones demanding change, but movements which are consciously struggling for socialism. So is it simply the case that the CWI will recruit and recruit and that will found a new mass international or will the forces that compose a new mass revolutionary international, will they come from other areas? What will happen? The CWI will be built in different forms. Obviously, if any individual wants to join with us, they're absolutely welcome to discuss with us, to hear about our ideas and to join and participate in our activity. But we understand we will not just build by recruiting individuals. To build a real mass force, you need to participate in movements and in struggles where whole groups of people can draw conclusions from the experiences, from the struggles they've been in. And in that way, you can build a movement out of attracting different groups together. Not just groups, but also parties, whole movements together. And we see that that will be the way in which the CWI actually develops and begins to become a truly mass force. And in that sense, we're prepared to discuss and cooperate with any genuine forces which exist. You know, discuss and cooperate in different ways. But at the same time, if there is a basis of political agreement, then obviously we should come together. And this was, for instance, Wayne Trotsky worked in the early 1930s after the victory of Hitler. Immediately after the victory of Hitler, Trotsky discussed with other left groups in Europe and also his supporters with other left groups in different countries around the world. And the initial call for building a new international at the end of 1933 wasn't just signed by the organisation which Trotsky led. It was also signed by three other organisations as well, three other smallish parties who weren't, if you like, quote-unquote Trotskyists. They also signed the call to build a new international. And Trotsky again and again attempted to involve the wider layers. And we carry on in that tradition. And we see that, for instance... If you look at the Communist International, it was built as a mass force in different ways. In some countries, whole parties or parts of parties voted to join the Communist International en bloc. That's how it rapidly became a mass force in some countries in the early 1920s. And we see our development in a similar way. Not just from the activities which we undertake, the supporters of CWI undertake in different countries, but also through events and struggles us coming together with other groupings, with other forces, in order to build the sort of international that we need. Now, this is a part of our series on Trotsky and Trotskyism. 
And this represents a chapter in the new book, which, of course, is called Leon Trotsky, a revolutionary whose ideas couldn't be killed. This chapter on Trotsky and the Fourth International by Robert Beckett. You can read in full, get more about the ideas, and you can pre-order that book at leftbooks.co.uk. As always, if you like what you've heard, recommend us to your co-workers and friends. Donate to help fund us. And if you agree, join the socialists. Robert, thank you very much for speaking to us today. Great pleasure. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for Workers International. Today we heard from Robert Beckett speaking to James Ivans and Aomi Sapria. This episode was edited by Dick Hart. The CWI is producing a new book on Trotsky's life and ideas for the 80th anniversary of his assassination, which this podcast series is following. It's called Leon Trotsky, a revolutionary whose ideas couldn't be killed. You can pre-order it now at leftbooks.co.uk. You can find further reading on this episode in the notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Do you agree with the policies and actions that the Socialist Party is fighting for? Then we need you. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We rely only on funding from the working class, which maintains our political independence. So help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity.